Good morning. Welcome to the house of the Lord as we celebrate and worship together today. And this morning we continue our sermon series on the fruit of the Spirit. So we're excited to have you with us. Also notice in the bulletin the different opportunities that we have. We have a couple of Bible studies. Uh, one on John that will be Wednesday night on Zoom and Thursday in person uh, starting August 16th. And then we have a Zoom Bible study Tuesday at 5.30 with Lindsay studying Simon Peter. We also have our school supply and backpack collection, and uh, this gives you everything that um, they need to have in their backpacks. And uh, if you will start bringing those, uh, we'll set up a spot out there to make our collection. And this goes to the little schoolhouse, and it's about 45 kids um, that need help and support, and we do this every year, and we've probably been doing it since the 1990s that I'm aware of, uh, so it's a wonderful opportunity for us. We also have our fifth Sunday offering for the uh, children's home, if you're interested in helping support that as well. Let us prepare our hearts for worship as we stand with our opening hymn, To God Be the Glory. Let us stand. using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, 
He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You're seated if you'll turn around and look at one another and wave to one another. And we've got several in the balcony today. I see you all up there in the corner. <laughs> Great to have everyone this morning. You may be seated. Our scripture reading first comes to us from the prophet Micah. Chapter 6, verses 6 through 8. Hear now the word of God. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousand rivers of olive oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression? the fruit of my body, for the sin of my soul. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good and what is required of you, to act with justice, to love with mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. The second lesson comes to us from Galatians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we'll reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. And finally, from Thessalonians 5:11. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your presence. May my words become your message for each of us, your people. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. As many of you know, I was gone last week for a wonderful wedding. My nephew, my youngest nephew, Jack, was married in the Amalfi Coast. Somebody's got to go there, right? <laughs> it was wonderful. It was beautiful. Well, we met several Italians while we were over there. Some of them were our drivers. Some were tour guides. But they spoke so fondly about their lives, about their love of the land, about growing their own tomatoes and olives, about spending time with their family. One gentleman told us he lives with 20 people, you know, three generations. And this is what they do. They love life and they live together. And he said that this is the life this is the one they chose to live. Now, if you've heard anything about Italians, they call it the la dolce vita, living life to the fullest, with your family, with your friends, with food, 
with nature, with art, and with fun. As we continue our sermon series on the fruit of the Spirit, we see that this fruit grows and flourishes as we are connected to God and Christ. Today, we focus on goodness and patience. The front of your bulletin has the list of all the fruit of the Spirit that are accessible to us through God's Holy Spirit. Today, we look at goodness and patience. Now, the founder of Methodism, John Wesley, we have the, the uh, beautiful tribute to him in the stained glass window, the stecken on the top. John Wesley described three simple rules for the good life. Do no harm, do good, and stay in love with God and your neighbor by practicing your faith. These three practices correlate to the passage in Micah. Practice justice, love with mercy, walk humbly with your God. Recently, many psychologists and social scientists have told us that hurt people hurt people. One conclusion is that our own healing of our own pain through our faith practices or therapy or treatment, include reaching out to our neighbors, will help us heal and refrain from hurting people. When John Wesley tells us to do no harm, he is implying that nurturing our faith and discipleship through worship and study and prayer and acts of service, we can bring hope and healing so that we'll be better equipped to do good and to refrain from behaviors and attitudes and words that are harmful. Now, doing good and goodness is not about comparison or judgment. I'm good, you're not. No, that's not where we're going with this. The Christ follower has no use for self-righteous platitudes and insensitive judgments towards their neighbor. Good brings light. Good brings love and hope wherever it enters. Good is carried forth in our thoughts, our words, and our deeds. Goodness can be measured in acts of mercy, service, and encouragement as well as attitudes and words that bring out positive results. Goodness enhances the world with its best ideals, with loving deeds, with faithful, fruitful practices. Goodness overcomes evil and triumphs over the obstacles placed before it through a commitment to shared common goals and common values. Now, goodness isn't puffed up with self-importance. That's called self-righteousness. That's not what goodness is. Goodness isn't looking for name recognition at every opportunity. Did you notice the good things I did? Sometimes people will take a selfie of something they're doing that's good. Now, the one thing you'll notice is that goodness should be pouring forth daily not just on special occasions. Goodness is served best by being part of something bigger than ourselves and making a lasting contribution. One of our responsibilities as Christ's followers and leaders is to use our influence to eradicate incivility, disrespect, and rudeness, which are undermining our families, our communities, even our churches. It's not just about noticing or denouncing the wrongs around us, but actually committing ourselves to a higher standard, a standard that uplifts and empowers rather than puts down or belittles. Jealousy and insecurity and abuses of power contribute to harm. Do no harm. Encouragement, accountability, 
and empowerment lead to goodness. In a recent article in a magazine called Work Human, creating a culture of goodness in the workplace is seen as the most resilient and sustainable practice for a business to thrive. According to Paul Betts, a coach for more than 250 executives and CEOs, goodness is creating an environment where people thrive together in a culture of encouragement, accountability, and positive teamwork. He's the CEO and founder of Good Leadership Enterprise. He points out that leaders, a job for the leaders is not only to find goodness, but to make it grow in every person as a part of their enterprise. He believes that leaders can do this through what he calls the seven F's. Now you've heard some of these before. Faith, family, finances, fitness, friends, fun, and future. This is going out in the business world, a culture of goodness. What causes people to thrive? He compares these seven Fs to wheels on a cart. Momentum will ensue if the seven are in balance. But if not, it's difficult to move forward. For faith, he mentions that the focus is spiritual well-being. He notes that even 4,000 years ago, Egyptians and Chinese figured out that the most productive people have a connection with their mind, their body, and their spirit. He says it's not about preaching as a leader, but being able to lead with an open heart, to be committed to something bigger than yourself, and to practice goodness, kindness, and mutual respect. He even points to recent trends that reveal that businesses that focus on excellence, generosity, fairness, and positivity do better than those focused on profits alone. In another article in Forbes magazine, it said the days of Gordon Gecko's Greed is Good are gone. Remember that movie, Wall Street? Greed is good, it's gone. Trends show that the businesses that are thriving emphasize sustainability, well-being, and the culture of goodness impacting the world for good says businesses that focus on profits and cost-effective priorities are having difficulty with employee retention and accountability in their leaders. Isn't it true? Whether it's our church, our business, our community, our school, successful churches, businesses, companies have a responsibility to make this world a better place. It's true that we are called to create this culture of goodness in our families, in our workplace, in our communities, in our churches. It involves a lot more than our willpower and determination. The fruit of the Spirit is manifested because of our connection to God. Even John Quincy Adams, as a founder of America, said that patience and perseverance have an effect before which difficulties disappear and obstacles begin to vanish. We get to patience now. Now patience, most of us don't consider ourselves very patient. Patience isn't about slow to go. Patience is really about being intentional. It's a practice. It involves the spirit. Patience is aware of timing, patterns, positioning, and purpose. Patience knows when to wait and when to step in. Now the farmer knows when to plant and when to harvest. Planting in a hurry 
or harvesting hastily can jeopardize the entire operation. The awareness of what is needed for the best results takes time. This is true in life. Whether you're raising children or you're in a relationship or you're working on a project, time and patience are important. Rushing things and being impatient can in fact impede growth and ruin development. If you plant a seed and pull it up too quickly, it will die. You will never see its full potential grow. Patience is considerate of the process and all the ingredients needed for the best results. There are seasons and patterns in life as well as in farming, business, child rearing, partnership, marriage. Patience sees a cocoon and knows that the butterfly needs time to have stronger wings. An impatient person wants the butterfly now and cuts open the cocoon to see how far it's come only to cripple it and destroy its beauty and its longevity. Patience is a gift. It takes time and patience to build a meaningful life, to build a meaningful relationship, to have lasting commitments. At times in life, we may have to pivot and learn from our mistakes. In our scriptures this morning, we see the prophet Micah pointing to God's design for the good life. He says, God has told you, mortals, what is good and what is required of you to do justice, to love with kindness, to walk humbly with your God. We see Paul pointing out the nine fruits of the Spirit and then about our walk with God, when he says, let us not grow weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap the harvest if we don't give up. Therefore, let us, as we have opportunity, do good. Now, John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement, put it this way. Do all the good you can, in all the ways you can, to all the people you can, in every place you can, at all the times you can, with all the zeal you can, as long as you ever can. Paul writes to the Thessalonians, encourage one another, build each other up, just as you are doing now. And later he says, make sure that no one pays back wrong with wrong, but always strives to do what is good for each other, for everyone. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. The one who calls us is faithful, and he will do it. We are truly blessed with the fruit of the Spirit accessible to us through our faith and trust in our good God. Now, as we think about goodness, isn't it true that the only way we can be good is because we have a good God? There's a beautiful song by C.C. Winans called The Goodness of God. Because God is good and God is faithful, we too can be good. She says, I love you, Lord, for your mercy never fails me. All of my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. Because all my life you have been faithful, and all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath, breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. I love your voice, for you have led me through the fires. In the darkest night, you are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. I have lived in the goodness of God. 
Even King David the psalmist knew this well when he ends his famous shepherd psalm, Psalm 23. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Our song of reflection is Amazing Grace. Let us turn now to God in prayer. O Lord, most holy and gracious, we are grateful for your goodness, for your faithfulness, even for your patience with us. Forgive us when we are short-sighted, when we do not see all the potential before us, when we are not willing to take the time necessary. Help us, O God, to grow in faithfulness, to grow in friendship, to grow in opportunity to serve you. We are grateful, O oh God, for each one gathered here, for those who are watching online with us as well. For those who are traveling, we pray your safe mercies. We give you thanks for all your good gifts, for the opportunities we have in worship and prayer and study and fellowship and in service. We give you thanks and praise, and we offer all of our prayers in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us stand for our closing hymn, How Firm a Foundation.
Now let us receive God's blessing and benediction. We invite you to the parlor for some refreshments. Let us receive God's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face to shine upon you. May he give to you the gift of goodness that others might see in you a glimpse of his love. May he give to you the gift of patience that you might know the timing, the pattern, and the purpose. Receive these gifts in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>